Welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to discuss limits of complex functions, i.e. limits in complex analysis. Now, this is completely and utterly analogous to how limits of functions are defined in vector analysis. So, if you were to look at the definition for the limit of a function from R2 to R2, it's exactly analogous to what we're going to see here. Despite that, we're going to go over the definition separately here. So, I'm going to begin by doing an example just to make sure that everyone is familiar with the intuitive concept of what a limit is, and then we'll go full on with the rigorous definition of what a limit is. So, I'm going to give an example using a function. So I'm going to start with the initial function, a really simple function. f of z is going to be equal to z plus, and then we'll have the constant complex number i plus 1. So that, of course, is a complex number. So this is a really simple example of a complex function. Now let's just draw a picture over here. So we'll draw, as always, a picture for our domain and a picture for our codomain here. And the mapping f is going to be a mapping from one to the other. So let's just think about what this function is actually going to do. What, how can we visualize this? Well, think about what this complex number that we've used here, i plus 1, actually is. i plus 1, it, you're going to have 1 plus i, so it's going to be this point here, 1 to the right and 1 upwards. And I might just mark that on in red here. So, if we're going to add that to every single complex number, what's going to happen? Well, think where 0 is going to end up. 0 plus i plus 1 is going to end up at this point. So 0 is going to be mapped onto the point over here in our codomain. If we think where 1 would end up, it's going to have 1 plus i added onto it, so it would end up at 2 plus i. So everything is going to effectively be translated by this little arrow from 0 to i plus 1, like so. That's what this function actually looks like. Imagine taking this entire complex plane that is the domain here and moving every single point along by 1 and up by 1, i.e. translating everything by this vector. That is the point that it will be mapped onto in the codomain over here. So that's quite simply what this function looks like. Now, that's not the actual function that I want to use as the example to explain what a limit is. That's only part of it. So I'm now going to make f of z more complicated. So I left some space here deliberately. So we're going to make it more complicated. That is going to be true for all z. This is an element of the complex plane except for one point. And that one point is going to be the point zero. So what I'm saying is I'm modifying this function now, and unfortunately um, I didn't leave enough space, and now um, I'm writing over my picture, unfortunately. But what I'm doing is modifying this function. So I'm saying we're going to make our function f of z equal to this for all points of the complex plane, apart from we've taken one point out, and that is the point zero. So every point apart from the origin here, the additive identity in the complex numbers, this very important point zero, they are going to be mapped using this function, i.e. exactly what we've just talked about. They're going to be translated along one and up one over onto the codomain here. For zero, however, I am now going to define something else. We're just going to send it to some random point, and I've chosen minus three just randomly, and that's going to be what the answer is for z is equal to zero. So I've defined this more complicated, more stupid function. And by the way, there was really nothing in this minus 3. I could have set it to minus 10. I could have set it to 4 plus i. I could just chose some random number in the complex numbers uh, that doesn't fit with the pattern over here. It's important that I didn't send it to i plus 1, which would have fitted with the pattern here. So let me just make sure that everyone understands what this function actually means then. All the points in the complex plane here, apart from the origin, they are going to be mapped according to this up here. So they're going to be shifted along one and up by one, and that's what they're going to be mapped onto in the codomain over here. Meanwhile, the point zero is not going to be mapped onto i plus one, which is what you would expect it to be mapped onto. Instead, it is going to be mapped onto negative three. So we might even draw that on here. So negative three can be shown here, and this point is going to be mapped there whilst everything else is going to be mapped uh, to z plus i plus 1. Right. 
Now, let's draw a little bit more on this picture. So I'm going to draw on a unit circle around the origin. So this is supposed to be a circle of radius 1 centred around 0. And the reason I'm doing this is I just want to show where most of this circle is going to be taken to in the codomain, where it's going to be mapped onto in the codomain, because I think that's going to illustrate the picture quite nicely. So all of these points in this circle, apart from zero, which we know is going there, where are they all going to be mapped to? Well, they're going to be translated along one and up one. So then the circle is now going to have center i plus one here, and it's going to be mapped like so. So that's where most of that circle is going to be moved to, apart from, of course, we know that the centre of the circle, nothing is mapped onto there, because the point that would have been mapped onto there was the origin, but that's going to negative 3 now. OK, and of course, all the other points around the circle, they go to the analogous points around the circle in the codomain here. So that nicely illustrates what this function is doing. So, if you ask the question, what is f of 0, the answer is negative 3, indisputably. If you ask me where does 0 go under this function, the answer is negative 3. However, there is another question that we can now ask, which is what is the limit as z approaches 0 of f of z? And that is a different question, because what this means is what would you expect f of z to be? What does the value of f of z approach as z approaches 0? So this means come in towards 0 from all these points around. As you converge in, you never actually get to 0. When you're taking a limit as something approaches something, you never actually go to the point. You don't... This is not asking this question. This is asking a different question. This is if you are a little man in the domain here and you walk towards the point zero, but you never ever get to the point zero. You just walk towards it from whatever direction you like. Um, and you ask, where are these points being mapped to? So you say, wherever you go in here, you can work out where is that point being mapped to in the codomain. And you look at these points, and then you say, as I get closer and closer to z is equal to zero, what are the values getting closer and closer to in the codomain? Where would I expect this point zero to be mapped to in the codomain? That's what this is effectively asking. It's saying, if you're a little man in the domain here, and you approach z is equal to zero, and you study where the values of f of z are, are being mapped onto in the codomain as you get closer and closer to zero, what are those values approaching? If your best guess, if you were a betting man and you were going to place a bet on where z is equal to zero was going to be mapped onto by this function, where what would you bet on? And the answer, of course, is that it would be i plus 1. That's what it all approaches. However, that is not. You would have been wrong if you were betting that you're wrong, obviously. In this case, the limit is unexpected. That is the correct answer for what the limit is. But of course, the limit does not equal what the point is actually mapped onto in this case. So the limit doesn't have to be the same as what the point is actually mapped onto. It's what you would expect it to be mapped onto by looking at what all its neighbouring points are being mapped onto. If this function made sense, if it was continuous where would that point have been mapped onto? That is the concept of the limit of a function. Now, often, if we have beautiful functions, and often in complex analysis we do study beautiful functions, the limit as z approaches a point will equal the same value as that point actually equals. So we could have taken a nicer, more sensible example if we took, for instance, the point 1 here, and we asked, what is the limit as z approaches 1? of f of z, well, of course, that's going to be um, 2 plus i, because, um, again, we could draw a little ball of points around 1. In fact, I might even do that. Um, so we could draw a little ball, like so, around those points, or, sorry, around that point 1, and we could say, where are all of those going to end up? Well, of course, on the codomain, that ball is now going to be centred around 2 plus i, so again, if you're a little man studying this point, getting closer and closer to this point and studying what are the points near it being mapped onto, your guess of where that point would actually be being mapped onto would be 2 plus i. And of course, because 
we didn't make an exception for z is equal to 1. z is equal to 1 is being mapped onto 2 plus i, so in this case, the limit would agree with what f of 2, sorry, f of 1 actually is. And indeed, for most of the points, in fact, for all of the points on the complex plane apart from z is equal to 0, where I made this stupid mess here, the limit as z approaches that point of the function will be equal to the actual value of the function. So the purpose of that example was just to try and illustrate to you the intuition behind what a limit actually means. It is what you would expect the value of the function to be at that point by looking at all the other neighbouring points. So it's asking what does the value of the function converge to? What is the limit of the function as you get closer and closer in the domain to the point of interest? And the whole point, of course, of limits is to study examples where you can't actually work out the value of the function at that point. Or, you know, it might not be defined, the function might not be defined, for instance, at that point, but there is still a limit. So to give you an example of what I mean by that, Let's go back to white pen. If we defined the function f to be equal to z over z, now you might think that's a bit of a mundane function. I'm taking really easy examples, but actually it's a really interesting, crucial example. Now, for most complex numbers, for all complex numbers where z is not equal to zero, so if you say z, oops, let me reverse that. Uh, so if you take z is not equal to 0, then the multiplicative inverse exists. You can divide any complex number that isn't 0 by itself, multiply it by its multiplicative inverse if you want to get strict in abstract algebra, uh, and of course you'll end up with the multiplicative identity. So the answer here will be equal to 1, provided that z is not equal to 0. So this is a really simple function. It's just going to map most of the complex plane onto the answer 1. It's almost a constant function. However, when z is actually equal to 0, you hit a massive problem because this function is not defined. The multiplicative inverse of the additive identity 0 is not defined in a field. So it, this function isn't defined at z is equal to 0. So there's no answer. z is equal to 0 has to be omitted from the domain. You can't map it onto something, or you'd have to map it onto something else. You could define, for instance, say, I want to map it onto negative 3. But this is not defined for z is equal to 0. Regardless, of course, you could take the limit as z approaches 0 of this, and of course the answer would be 1, because everything infinitesimally close to z is equal to 0 is being mapped onto 1. So again, the answer you would expect z is equal to 0 to be is 1. Um, just a, another little comment. Uh, the reason that uh, you cannot divide by 0 is that if you try and define a multiplicative inverse for the additive identity, which is 0, you end up breaking the rules of field theory. You end up usually uh, breaking um, um, distributivity, which is a very important property of fields, the distributive law. So if you, w you, of course, could sit down and take the real numbers or the complex numbers, and you could create a new symbol that is going to be the multiplicative inverse of the additive identity. However, if you do that, the structure that you end up with will not be a field. It will, it's like a carpet, trying to fit a too big carpet into a room. If you get it to fit in one corner, another corner will break, another corner will come up. Uh, basically, if you try and create an inverse, a multiplicative inverse for the additive identity in a field, uh, you end up breaking distributivity or even maybe even the more crucial uh, property. And those other properties are far more important than having a multiplicative inverse for the additive identity. So that's why uh, this cannot be defined in a field algebra, the multiplicative inverse of the, the additive identity. Right, um, so that's an example then where you even though the function isn't defined as a point, the limit can still be ascertained, which is where limits really become extremely important in maths and in analysis. So, now then, uh, let's now discuss the rigorous definition then of uh, what a limit of a complex function is equal to. 
In fact, I think we'll have a break here and in the next video we'll do that.